if I didn't have to be here, quite honestly, I might have Zoomed this morning. <laughs> Tony's home with two scared dogs, but he did promise to Zoom me. And this is the last Sunday I have to be Zoomed, so I'm excited. It's just not my thing. But I'm glad to all of you for being here. I'm thankful to all of you for being here, and I'm glad that hopefully some people at home are watching too. Our quarter this time has been called Confident Hope. Our unit is on faith and salvation. And today's lesson is salvation available to all. And today, I'm going outside the box a little bit. Because inside the box was the same thing that has been said for all of the lessons for Romans. And if I say it to you like that again, you're going to zoom me right on out. So this is going to be a little different. Rita's lesson talked about righteousness, getting right with God, being morally right. And that's a big part of today's lesson, too. We're still in the book of Romans. Paul is still talking to his people in Rome. Um, he's emphasizing that righteousness no longer depends just on observance of the laws of Moses, but that you can get righteousness through belief in Christ. In the book of Romans, Paul addresses broad questions of theology. Now, at the time when he wrote this lengthy letter to the people in Rome, he'd never visited the actual church there. He had acquaintances there. And while I was looking at generalities from the, the book of Romans, I didn't realize all these familiar verses to me came from the book of Romans. Listen. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love for us, us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. I didn't realize all those, those Bible verses came from Romans. They're very familiar. So bottom line, Paul was a good preacher. He was a very good preacher. In Romans chapter 9, he introduced the broad subject of the place of the Jews in God's master plan. Paul calls the Jews my own race, my people. And he's extremely concerned that they get this right, that they get right with God. He begins chapter 10, which is where our scripture from today comes, by saying, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. And again, he talks about getting saved through salvation as opposed to obeying the law, that righteousness is available through faith. Paul emphasizes you have two choices, two paths. You can keep the law perfectly or you can receive grace through faith. Well, forget path number one. That's not happening. Nobody can keep the law perfectly. I just quoted from Paul, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that pathway is not going to work. It's got to be salvation through faith. In Romans chapter 3, verse 27, key idea. Then what can we boast about doing to earn our salvation? Nothing at all. Why? Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It is based on what Christ has done and our faith in him. 
Last week, Bobby used the word acquittal in her lesson. Our acquittal is based on our faith in Christ. So what I've done with the lesson is try to say the same thing a different way. Now, to convince you that repetition can be useful and that saying something a different way can be very valuable, I have a lesson from my world. I'm going to say to you one of the most basic ideas you need to understand to be successful in calculus. Now, don't glaze over yet. It is the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x equals 0. At 7.30 in the morning, teenagers are going, if they even heard me at all. Some people will get that right away, but most won't. So the next thing I would do At this point, I would draw a big circle on the board and say this is a pizza pie. Every teenager can identify with a pizza pie. And I would cut it in half. Are you satisfied with half the pizza? Yeah, that would be pretty good. Then I would cut it in fourths. That's still okay. I'd rather have the half, but a quarter of the pizza is okay. Then I cut it in eight pieces. Mm -hmm. We're getting a little hungry now. This is not quite satisfactory. So I say to them, imagine if I cut it in a hundred pieces. And hopefully somebody will say, you might as well not get anything. Imagine a million pieces. Forget about it. And so I go back and say, Do you want a half, a little number on the bottom, or do you want a hundred, a big number on the bottom? If the big number's on the bottom, you get next to nothing. And that's saying something a different way. And that's what I'm going to try to do today with Paul's lesson from the book of Romans. I divided the lesson into four main ideas. Here's main idea number one. Doing good things isn't enough. And Rita referenced this in her lesson. Doing good things isn't enough. I read about taking a pilgrimage. And of course, the most familiar one is the, the nation of Islam and their pilgrimage to Mecca. We have a friend who did that with his dad, actually made that journey. It says in the commentary, in Mexico, pilgrims crawl toward a shrine that supposedly marks the place where Mary, Jesus' mother, is said to have appeared. In Greece, people travel to a statue that's supposed to have miraculous healing powers. In Tibet, people travel for days, even weeks, to get to the holy city of Lhasa. And did you know that every year, 20 million Hindus make a pilgrimage to the River Ganges? The river is considered a goddess, and if you touch the water, you are automatically purified and cleansed of all your sins. 
Now, all those things are not bad things. Those are great things to do. Those are holy things to do. But Paul says, by themselves, that's not enough. I was looking on, on the uh, Google, and I saw this article entitled, What Heaven Will Be Like. I thought, well, let me read up on that just in case, <laughs> just in case I get to go, see what heaven will be like. And the first thing I read was where to send my money. <laughs> you can't buy a ticket. Paul says you can't buy a ticket. I liked how Rita said in her lesson that a person who accepts Christ and salvation through Christ late in life hadn't had a lot of time to accumulate a long list of good works. And she used the example of the thief hanging on the cross beside Christ when Jesus was crucified. You know, he turned to the Lord at the end, but he was dying. He probably didn't have a long list of good stuff he's done. So doing good things isn't enough. That's what Paul says. Okay, lesson number two. Here's some of our scripture from today. Paul says, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So main idea number two is heart versus mouth. There was actually a worthwhile question in the commentary. I don't usually pay much attention to them, but listen to this. What mismatches between your heart and your mouth need to be resolved, and when will you start the repair job? What mismatches between heart and mouth need to be fixed, and when are you going to start working on it? That's worth considering. You know, once you say it, you can't unsay it. And in today's world, once you put it out there on Facebook, you can take it down, but it's been out there. Um, we had a great visit with our son and daughter-in-law yesterday. And our daughter-in-law, whose name is Kay, spelled just like me, um, and she's absolutely wonderful. But she's Asian. She's from Taiwan. And she came to the United States when she was six years old. She was in elementary school in a school where she was the only Asian child. And she took a lot of heat for it. So we were talking about bullying. And she said, you know, that's been around. That's universal. But when it happened to me, I didn't have to take it home with me. You could leave it at school. And now it goes everywhere with you. It goes on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. And that's what makes it so much worse. When you put it out there with your mouth, you can't take it back. Um, you can tell when a person is speaking from their heart. We all can. You know, when somebody says, hey, how you doing? Do they, they don't really want to know. No, they don't. That's just a figure of speech. And I'll tell you something I'm guilty of, is not listening enough. Sometimes the mouth is better closed. I'm guilty of if somebody says to me, if Tony comes home from work and says to me, I, I had a bad day at work today, I say, let me tell you what happened to me. <laughs> I don't even stop to let, I'm an only child, it's all about me. Let me tell you what happened to me. Um, I'm very guilty of that. Sometimes the mouth is better closed. So Paul says it takes both heart and mouth to witness and express faith. If you have mouth only without heart, you won't be successful in communicating faith and trust in God. 
him. Main idea number three comes from verses 12 and 13. There is no difference. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There is no difference. For Paul, there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. This is such an important and timely message, I think, for today. For God, there is no difference between white and brown and black. For our K, there's no difference between European and Asian. For God, there's no difference between Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist. K was explaining some of the Buddhist philosophies to us yesterday. It's amazing. For God, there's no difference between healthy and sick and disabled. Take time to listen to the other side, and we'll probably learn something. And here's something that I feel very strongly about. You don't have to agree with me in order for me to appreciate you. You don't have to think like I do to be my friend. If we had more of that, I think we'd be in a better place today. Because to God, it doesn't make any difference how you think as far as he is the primary focus of your life. If we all had the same goals and ideologies, that would be pretty boring. There'd be nothing to discuss, nothing to learn, and even... The older we get, you can still learn. You can learn from other people. And, you know, Jesus healed sinners. Jesus worked with the social outcast of his day. It didn't make any difference to him. Jesus didn't say to his disciples, come on, guys, leave them alone. They're not our kind of people. He didn't do that. So I think we need to take time and listen because Paul says there is no difference. And main idea number four. You can't hold someone responsible for something they didn't know about. So Paul says spread the news, spread the gospel. If I don't know about the rules, you can't hold me responsible. Now, unfortunately, there are many, plenty of 25 mile per hour speed limit signs on Church Street and Bank Street. There are plenty. I know the speed limit is 25 miles an hour. One day, not too terribly long ago on Bank Street, Parker Jernigan stopped me for 43. Tony called Dan Riddle and said, you should have, Parker should have given her the ticket. I promise, Parker, I will never do it again, and I have not. Tony can tell you, she goes 20, she might go 26, but she goes right at 25 miles an hour on Church Street and Back Street. I have not broken that promise. But sure, he should have given me the ticket. I was late for an MRI appointment, but, you know, that's no excuse. That's my fault. But I was aware of the rules, and so you can hold me responsible for that. But if somebody's not aware of the news, you can't hold them responsible. Paul says make people aware that salvation through faith is available to everyone. Now, I'm not a preacher kind of person. This is as close as I get, and I hope I don't sound preachy here. But I say preach however you can. Use whatever gifts you have. You know, we have a blessing in this church that every single Sunday morning, Fran Smith is back there with those children. That is not a job I would want. But that's Fran's preaching. That's how she gives back. 
you know, do what you can, do what you're comfortable with. Some people are good at evangelizing, not me. I saw in the commentary um, a poet was referenced. His name is Edgar Guest, and I had heard the name, but I looked him up because I loved his quote in the commentary. Edgar Guest was born in England in 1881. He died in 1959, and his family immigrated to Detroit, Michigan. His father died while he was still in school, so he had to quit school and go to work. So he never finished high school. He took a job as a copy boy for the Detroit Free Press, the big newspaper in town. A copy boy is just an errand boy. And he ended up working there the better part of 65 years. Now, this is a man that never finished school. He wrote his first poem in 1898, and he ended up with a weekly column that was syndicated to over 300 newspapers nationwide. He was on NBC Radio and NBC TV in 1951, and he was called the Poet of the People. So I looked at some of his poems. They're relatively short, and I would describe them as earthy. I can see why he was called the poet of the people. If you get a chance, Google Edgar Guest. It's just like G-U-E-S-T, a guest in your home. His poems are, are quite delightful. His poems are like Tony says a Norman Rockwell painting is. You don't have to interpret it. I know what's in that picture. So give, give him a try if you get a chance. The quote that I loved is he says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And so I'm going to tell you a sermon that happened to us a couple of weeks ago, a sermon I saw. I got a text from my neighbor, Jane Nojic, down on Lover's Lane, Sunday night two weeks ago today. It was about 8 o'clock, and she said, somebody just took out all the mailboxes. You know, our mailboxes are down on Lover's Lane because they won't come up the path. There are eight mailboxes down there. We each had our own post and mailbox. She sent a picture. Everything was destroyed. The posts were in pieces. The mailboxes were all bent up. And there was a young man sitting on the guardrail on his cell phone. Well, the next day, she sent another text saying, somebody's down there at the mailbox is doing something. And a policeman had come on Sunday night and given us an accident report in the name of the young man who was responsible and his insurance company. He came to all eight houses. So I walked, nosy me, I put my rain slicker on because it was raining and walked down there to see what's going on. Well, it was the young man who was responsible for the accident, and he simply got distracted. And his uncle. This is a family that grew up in Windsor Baptist Church. All the children were raised in Sunday school. I said, I knew when Jane said somebody was down here, it would be y'all. The uncle helped the young man to build a nice wooden rack that holds all eight mailboxes. On Monday night, he came to each of our homes walking, not driving, <laughs> walking, with a notebook, took down our highest number, the kind of box we had, and where our box was in the lineup. And by Tuesday, we each had a newly installed mailbox with our highest number on it. They even, I had a mailbox cover on our box. He put the mailbox cover back on the box. If you had a big box, you got a big box. If you had a regular box, you got a regular box. And I thought, you know, number one, that's amazing. And that's a family that grew up in the church. And so they knew how to be. They knew if you make a mistake, you try to make it right for people. And to me, that, that, was, that was a sermon. I knew I taught this whole family. 
And so it was just really refreshing to see that kind of attitude. And he was so regretful. He was so so. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's all right. Accidents happen. You didn't get hurt. It was your grandma's truck. I hope she didn't hurt you. But all was well with the mailboxes. And so I say preach however you can. I found this was my mom's women's devotional Bible. And it has, of course, a lot of devotions in it. And I find one specifically from the book of Romans that speaks to faith, which is what our lessons have all been about. It's by a lady named Jan Johnson, and she says, I've had great ideas over the years of how God could solve my problems. I listed solutions for him. Change my grouchy neighbor's heart. Cure my friend of cancer. Make my spouse as devoted as the ones described in the how-to books on marriage. Some of these things happened, and some of them didn't. I felt that God disappointed me too many times. I see now that I have been using prayer as a weapon of control. I have tried to control God as if that were possible. With a surrendered attitude, I can bring my request to God in a different way. Say it a different way. I'm still fervent and consistent, but I don't have to tell God what to do. Instead, I watch, wait and cooperate. To accept God's sovereignty is one more necessary surrender in our journey of faith. And so to recap, my four main ideas from our lesson today said a little differently, doing good stuff isn't enough. We need a good blend of heart and mouth There is no difference, and preach however you can. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear God, may we be faithful to preach your gospel. May our faith in Jesus lead us to your promise of salvation. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for your attention, and have a great week.